Hey there, my name's Gary Sims and this is Gary Explains. This is the third of four videos about Risk Five. This one is talking about compliance and the danger of forking the Risk Five project. So if you want to find out more, please let me explain. Now I want to mention compliance. All established CPU design companies work hard to ensure that their designs work correctly and that they are compatible. So Intel, ARM, AMD, IBM all ensure the compatibility of their CPU designs. So when the next generation Intel comes out, we know it's going to run the same software that the previous generation ran. They are the guardians of their respective instruction sex architecture. It's essential for them that everything remains faithful and compatible. Okay, and actually Intel tried to change their eyes, so they tried to go to a 64-bit architecture that wasn't based on its x86 architecture. It was called Itanium, and it failed miserably. It failed miserably because Intel suddenly said, hey, let's have a whole new instruction set architecture. Let's do something completely different. You'll need to rewrite all your software. Oh, we'll give you the compilers. We'll help you do all the porting, but you're going to have, and it failed miserably. And that's why AMD 64 succeeded because AMD said, well, actually, can't we just take the existing x86 uh, ISA and then make it an x86-64 ISA, which is what they did. And we got AMD 64, then Intel finally had to capitulate and they did exactly the same thing and Itanium just died. So it is key that uh, these ISAs, whether they're commercial ones from Intel, ARM, IBM, AMD, whatever, they are they are, have compliance. They, they, they are compatible with what already exists. So how does compliance work on RISC-V? Well, compliance is actually a double-edged sword because while the technical information for Spark, for example, is free, using the Spark trademark requires two things. You need to be a member and you need to successfully complete the Spark compliance test. So even Spark as an open source ISA say, well, if you want to call it Spark, you're going to have to have this compliance test. That way we can ensure that everything with the Spark name on it actually is compatible with the right software. MIPS is actually, gives you the right to license under the R6 architecture. All the patents you can build and sell cores using the MIPS certified trademark for certified cores. So MIPS understand that if they want to, if people want to call something MIPS, they're going to have to be compliant. And that way people know what they're getting. Risk five, there's no compliance requirements whatsoever. Now that may sound like the utopia of, you know, no licensing fees, no trademark worries. No, actually this is a huge, huge problem. And we'll just talk about that now. Now, anyone is free to change RISC-5 and take it in a different direction, however they like. They could call it ICE-5. That's just a name I've made up there, whatever. No compliance required. Nobody can stop you from doing that. Interestingly, for commercial products, usage of the RISC-5 trademark or RISC-5 logo must follow the guidelines and is only permitted for member organizations who are party to the RISC-5 Foundation membership agreement. So even on Risk Five, actually, if you want to call something Risk Five, you're going to have to start paying your membership, and you're going to have to agree to their agreement. But it doesn't mean you can't take the Risk Five idea and call it something else without infringing the copyright and fork it in a whole different direction. But Risk Five, please don't do that because if you do that, then the compilers we provide won't work. Well, that's not really a problem because when AMD went and forked. Uh, you, you know, Intel x86 and made x86-64, they said, well, we don't care because we'll provide the compilers, we'll do the work ourselves, we'll use the work that already exists and we'll add it in. So Itanium AMD64 teaches us that worrying about the compilers doesn't make any difference. As long as what you build has got some kind of backwards compatibility, a default Risk five mode, and then you have the kind of the Risk five enhanced mode. Then actually, it doesn't matter. And so forking is a real issue here because there is no compliance. Nobody is forcing you to build a Risk five processor that works like anybody else's Risk five processor or is compatible with anybody else's Risk five processor. Now, open source software has told us one thing: forking is inevitable. It will happen. There's no way it's not going to happen. Whether it succeeds after it forks that's a whole different thing but any company with enough resources can fork and create its own ecosystem and amazon's fire tablets are a perfect example of forking android amazon fire tablets run android apps 
Amazon has its own set of services, Amazon has its own uh, app store, but actually it's all based off of Android. So any company with enough money and enough resources can fork Risk Five, and if it's got enough weight behind it, it can take it in its own direction and nobody can do anything to stop them. And we've seen this in the software world, Oracle Enterprise Linux is a fork of Red Hat. OpenBSD was actually a fork of NetBSD. LibreOffice is a fork of OpenOffice. And so on and so on and so on. There are so many examples of this happening. So it is inevitable that RISC-V will fork at some point in the future. Now, I talked a moment ago about extensions. Now, the battle between AMD and Intel, this is going back in history a bit here, has taught us that one company will add something to an instruction set and then the other company must either add an equivalent or copy. And this, we're going back to the days of MMX, 3D Now, SSE. These are all examples of how AMD and Intel, and even today when you talk about the virtualization properties, when you talk about some of these newer things with containers and with direct access and with memory protection and different bits that enable execution and all this stuff that goes on at a deep level in these CPUs, the two companies are either trying to do the equivalent of each other or trying to copy each other. Okay, and that's happening today. So either way, it demonstrates the real possibility of fragmentation because one design company needs to have a competitive edge over the other. Why am I, why would you buy my chip rather than buy somebody else's chip? And ultimately, the need to differentiate will turn risk five companies against each other. AMD and Intel are not friends. They are not friends, but they use the same ISA. They use the same instruction set, the x86 and the x86-64 instruction set. They both have support for things like SSE and SSE2 and 3 and 4 and all this kind of stuff but they're not friends they do not go out for drinks after work every day they are com they are competitors they want to outsell each other and ultimately risk five companies will turn to battle against each other and every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation every house divided against itself will not stand so once you start to get competitive uh uh, thing is going on, then this could actually cause Risk V to split down the middle. Again, it's going to be forking. Okay, so that was my third video of four about Risk V. I really do hope you're enjoying this series. One more video left to go, and that is my predictions about what will happen in the future. So I'll see you in that video.